Hey there, and welcome to this basic guide to Gwent. I've been asked numerous times to please explain Gwent and if I could possibly make a guide on it, so here it is. I'll be going over all the card types and rules and show you a few easy tricks to use as well. If you're only interested in very specific topics, I'll list some quick links to various topics in the description below. So let's start at the beginning. The goal of the Gwent card game is to get a higher combat point total than your opponent. You can gather these combat points by placing unit cards on the board that will strengthen your army. There are four factions in the game and each have their own unique set of cards to choose from. There's the Northern Realms, Scoia'tael, Monsters and the Nilfgaardian Empire. Each faction has their own strengths and weaknesses in regards to what cards they can have in their deck, so let me go over each card type first to help you better understand each faction's deck type. First, let's go over some general card rules. There are two types of cards, unit cards and special cards. The special cards consist of cards that have different effects on the unit cards. The unit cards each have a number in the top left corner that denotes their strength. The numbers range from 1 to 10 for normal cards, or even 15 for hero unit cards. Just below the combat strength number is an icon of either a sword, a bow and arrow, or a catapult. This denotes the unit type, a sword for melee, a bow and arrow for ranged, and the catapult used for siege units. So, now that you know about the regular unit card, let's have a look at the special effects a unit card can have. There are six different types of special effects. The Type Bond, Morale Boost, Medic, Spy, Agile and Muster. Type Bond doubles the combat strength of any of the cards with the same name that are in play on the board. However, it only really doubles for the first card. While the animation does show that the combat strength will be doubled with a times 2 pop-up, in reality, the original combat strength of the card is simply added to each card every time another card of the same type is played. So, a single Blue Stripes Commando in play will count for 4 combat points. Putting another Blue Stripes Commando on the board will double the strength of each card, up to 8. So that gets you a total of 16 points. Another Commando adds the original card value again. So adding 4 to each card in play to 12 combat strength each for a total of 36, and so on, making these types of cards very powerful. Morale boost will increase the combat strength of all units in the same row as the card with the ability by 1, although it doesn't buff its own strength of course. Medic will allow you to choose one of the unit cards in your discard pile and play them again. The unit card can't be a hero type card though. Spy will cause the card you play to be put on the opponent's side of the board. However, you will be allowed to draw two cards. Agile will allow you to choose what kind of unit type card you want to play this card as, choosing between the two shown on the card. So in this case, for example, you can play the card as either a melee card or a ranged card. Muster cards when played will search your deck for any of the same type of cards in your deck, and then those cards will be put into play as well. Finally, there's one more type of card, which is the hero card. Hero cards cannot be affected by any of the special cards and they cannot be resummoned from your discard pile by use of a medic. Hero cards are the only unit cards that can have a combat strength value of over 10, namely the Geralt and Siri cards, which both play for 15 points. Next we have the special cards, with most prominently the weather cards, Biting Frost, Impenetrable Fog, Torrential Rain and Clear Weather. Biting Frost will cause all melee units on the field to count for only one. Impenetrable Fog makes all ranged units count for only one, and Torrential Rain makes all siege units count for only one. Clear Weather will remove Biting Frost, Impenetrable Fog and Torrential Rain cards from the field. Then we have the Commander's Horn. The Commander's Horn can be put in the field to double the combat strength of any of your three combat types, melee, ranged or siege. You can only have one Commander's Horn in play for each combat type. Scorch is a special card that when played will destroy the strongest combat unit on the field, regardless of whether they're your own or your opponent's. So, if the strongest combat unit is 5 and there are 3 cards in play with 5 combat strength, Scorch will destroy all of them. And finally, we have Decoy. Decoy will allow you to choose a unit card on your side of the field and return it to your hand so you can play it again. Of course, you cannot use it on hero cards. Then we have two more unit cards that break the mold ever so slightly, and that's Dandelion and Villain Threatenmirth. 
Dandelion is a melee unit that also acts as a commander's horn for the melee row. His effect does not stack with another commander's horn. Villain Threatenmirth is again a melee card which will check if the opponent's melee combat units count for at least 10 points. If they do, Villain Threatenmirth will destroy the strongest enemy combat units available as long as they're not hero cards. Since the Hearts of Stone expansion, there's also Shiru, who has the same ability as Villain Threatenmirth but for siege units, and the Toad card, which has the same effect but for ranged units. So, now that you know all about the different card types, let's talk a little more about the factions. Each faction, on top of their unique cards, also have different faction leader cards. These are cards you don't have to draw and that are always available in the form of a leader ability. Each faction has five different leader cards you can choose from, but you can only choose one, of course. I'll show you the most prominent ones, as most have a different variant of buffing units, destroying units, and playing weather cards, but some are more important or more interesting to the deck than others. The Northern Realm has Foltest the Steelforged and Foltest the Son of Medel. Most of the Northern Realm leader cards are pretty standard, I've picked these two out of the list because the Northern Realm is the only deck that gets to choose between two of the Scorch-type abilities instead of just the one most decks have. Steelforged destroys the strongest card in the opponent's siege unit's row, as long as their combined strength is 10 or more, and Son of Medel does the same for ranged units. Quite useful as you can switch around depending on what you fight. The Scoia'tael has Francesca Findebear, Daisy of the Valley, and Francesca Findebear, Hope of the Enche. The Daisy of the Valley grants you an extra card at the start of the game, which is quite powerful as you might draw that one Scorch that you needed as an answer. Hope of the Enche moves any agile units you have in play to whatever row grants them the highest combat points. This is a pretty good finisher after your opponent has already passed and thinks they've won. Monsters has Eredin Destroyer of Worlds, Eredin Bringer of Death and Eredin Brea Glass the Treacherous. Destroyer of Worlds discards two of your currently held cards and allows you to draw any one card of your choice from your deck, which is really great if you're just looking for that one answer to win this fight. Bringer of Death allows you to restore any card from your discard pile, just like a medic. You'll likely only want to use this ability if you're fighting someone with spies, so you can resurrect the spies they played against you. Brea Glass the Treacherous doubles all strength of all spy cards currently in play. Again, an anti-spy leader card. If your opponent is, for example, Nilfgaard, who has a lot of very powerful spy cards, this will probably increase your damage quite a bit. The Nilfgaardian Empire has Emiava Emrys, Emperor of Nilfgaard, the White Flame, the Relentless, and Invader of the North. Emperor of Nilfgaard allows you to look at three random cards from your opponent's hand. If you're lucky, you might figure out if your opponent is still holding a villain Threatenmirth or a Scorch and you can more easily play around it. The White Flame cancels your opponent's leader ability. This is really only useful if it's something you just don't want to deal with that fight. The Relentless allows you to draw a card of your opponent's discard pile, just like a medic. Pretty useful if you're playing the spies and you want to take them back from your opponent's discard pile. Invader of the North causes the medic ability to restore a random unit to the battlefield instead of allowing choice, and this counts for both sides. You can use this ability if you're very confident that whatever card you restore, it'll always be useful. So now you know all about the cards you can play in the game of Gwent. Let's go over the playing board quickly to top that off. At the top left of the screen is your opponent's leader card, and right beneath that is their faction. Just beneath that is a number next to some cards, which shows the amount of cards your opponent has on hand. To the right of this number are two gems. Each red gem counts as a life. Whenever someone loses a round, one of their gems shatter, until both gems are shattered for either side. Right next to the gems is another number. That number denotes the amount of total combat strength that side has. Whichever side has a laurel around their number is currently leading, so the highest number and your side of the board is mirrored in the same way, of course. Between the two character panes is a wooden pane where any weather cards you play will be displayed. Then, in the middle of the screen, you'll see three rows for each side of the board. On each of these rows, you'll see the sword, bow and arrow and catapult icon we already know from the cards. And so they denote the rows where each of your unit cards will go. To the left of each row is another number again, which will show you how much strength that row has. All the way to the right shows each player's deck and the cards still left in it, and to the left of their deck is their discard pile. 
So now you know everything there is to know about the basics of Gwent. So let's go back to the factions and look at their strengths along with the various cards and their most important uses. The Northern Realms deck focuses mainly on spies and siege units. Since they have quite a few strong units to place along with Foltest's the Siege Master, which is the leader card that doubles siege strength, it's a very easy synergy. But the most important part of this deck are the spies. They have Prince Stennis at 5 strength, Sigismund Dijkstra at 4 and Thaler at 1. And of course, since the spies are placed on the opposite side of the board, you want them to be as weak as possible. Having 3 spies makes for a lot of extra card draw and card draw basically always wins you the game. Whoever has the most cards in the end usually wins. Along with the three spies, they also have a single medic, the Dunbanner medic, and one of their most powerful units, the Blue Stripes Commando. You can find four throughout the game, although some have reported finding five, and they have the tight bond buff, which means if you play all four during a game and they don't get scorched, they get you 64 points and that's without a commander's horn. Alongside the Blue Stripes, you also have access to two catapults, which is another tight bond unit at eight strength. Unfortunately, they only have two available, but that still counts for a solid 32 strength. Their faction perk is to draw an extra card whenever you win a round. Scoia'tael to me generally seemed like a mix of all the other decks. They have three medics, all have car healers. They have three sets of muster cards, have car smuggler, dwarven skirmisher and elven skirmisher. And then they have nine agile units. They don't have any spies and honestly, that's their greatest weakness. Spies are so powerful, not having any in your deck except for the neutral card Mysterious Elf is immensely damaging. It's somewhat countered by having the three healers because it means you can resummon the spies your opponent plays the next turn, but it does mean you're limited to the spies they play and if they have decoys and you don't, you're still in trouble. Squayatel does also have Isengrim, Falcharna and Milva, two morale boost cards, but it doesn't quite make up for the loss of spies. Their faction perk is to decide who gets to go first at the start of the game. Monsters deck is built around muster cards entirely. They win by numbers. They have five muster sets, Neckers, Ghouls, Arakas, Crone and Vampire, and each set generally has more than three cards in it too, except for the Crones. So the goal is to get as many units as possible on the field and then hopefully put down a Karen card with a morale boost buff to boost all their numbers as well. This is probably the easiest to counter deck, however, because they rely on mass numbers so much and a lot of the cards are in the melee row, it always pays to have some biting frost cards in your hand, which will immediately destroy their numbers. So, as a monster player, you will always want to have two clear weather cards available in your deck or you're quite honestly out of luck. Again, they don't have any spies and they also don't have any healers. Their faction perk is to keep one random unit card on the board after each round. Finally, the Nilfgaardian Empire is a lot like the Northern Realms, however, on top of their spies, they also have three healers, which is very powerful. Unfortunately, their spies are a little lacking, though they still have three, their numbers are quite high. Vache de Rideau is lowest at four strength, Schillard Fitz Usterlen has seven, and Stefan Skellen has nine strength. Like the Northern Realms, they also have their own version of the Blue Stripes, but they're one point weaker than them at three strength. You can also find four of them, so if you play them all, you'll gain 48 points. Quite honestly, the Northern Realms and Nilfgaard decks are extremely similar and their main difference lies in synergy. Nilfgaard's three healers versus Northern Realms single healer and siege unit synergy. Otherwise, they're very much alike. Their faction perk is to always win a round that ends in a draw. So now you know everything there is to know about the realms, the cards and the board. You'll be able to build a solid deck yourself, no doubt, but I still have a few tips and tricks that I personally use quite a lot, and I haven't really lost any games anymore since I completed my deck, even on hard mode. First, there's the three weather cards plus Scorch combo. You now know of the three weather cards that reduce all units on a single row to one point of attack. And you also know of Villain Trettenmirth, Shiru and Toad. The three cards that destroy the most powerful units in a certain row, as long as their full row strength is at least 10. So let's say you're playing against a monster deck, because this trick is most useful there. Your opponent has played a full row of monsters in their melee row, but you have Villain Trettenmirth and Biting Frost in your hand. You play the Biting Frost card, reducing all the unit's strength to 10, but there are 10 cards in the row to begin with, so that row strength is still 10. You can now play Villain Trettenmirth the next turn, which will look at the row, find their strongest unit, which in this case is all of them, as they all have the same strength, and he'll destroy all of the cards. You can't lose at this point. 
Be mindful though, as a tight bond will still buff each other to double their strength, so two if they're all reduced to one, which might destroy your combo. Yennefer of Vangerberg is a neutral card with the medic power, and this is mainly a Northern Realm trick because it's the only deck that has a medic with attack strength, the Dunbatter medic with five strength. But you can res a medic to res a medic. Let's say you have a Dunbanner medic in hand on turn one. You also see you have Yennefer of Vangerberg. Of course, during the first turn you can't res anything unless it's been killed by Scorch, so you won't be using those cards. But let's say your opponent has passed the turn already and you need five points to win that round. You can play the Dunbanner Medic anyway, because during the next turn you can play Yennefer of Vengerberg, use it to resurrect the Dunbanner Medic onto the field, and then you're allowed to use the Dunbanner Medic's card power to pick another card from your discard pile. This isn't really a trick, but more a solid tip. Get a bunch of decoys if you can. Decoys have a myriad of great uses. For example, you can use it on a spy played by your opponent, so you can play it back to them. Or you can use it on one of your own medics to perhaps bring back some more blue striped commandos, play an extra villain threat mirth, or get an extra spy. Decoys are almost never useless in a solid deck. And another tip is to not play out your strongest cards straight away. You might be tempted to play out all four blue stripes commandos one after the other once you have them in your hand, but you need to play around Scorch at all times. Unless you're convinced your opponent doesn't have Scorch in hand anymore, or if they've perhaps already passed, don't play tight bond cards like that especially, because they'll almost always be the strongest cards on the board at that point, and if all four blue stripes are on the board at the same time, they'll all get destroyed at the same time too. Look at the board, see what the strongest unit is, and try and stay below that number whenever you can. Final tip, know when you're outmatched. During the first turn, it's perfectly okay to pass the turn if you know you'll have to go all out to match your opponent's unit strength at that point. Perhaps your opponent started with four blue stripes and you don't have a scorch in your hand. That's fine, play some spies if you have them to stretch the turns and perhaps get them to burn some more cards. If you have medics in hand, you can also play as many cards on your side of the field as you have medics available to get those cards back again the next turn. Your opponent will have used a lot of their strong cards at that point, so the next two rounds should be much easier to handle for you. And that's all you really need to know to beat every opponent put in your path. I don't doubt that Blood and Wine will add some fresh cards as well, but you know how the game works now, so go get him, good luck, and va fail! Greetings, welcome! Actually kinda in the mood for cards. Care for a round of Gwent? I'm always in the mood for Gwent. <laughs> <laughs>